Hello and thank you for joining us here on More Than The Score. I'm Tony Moclair. We're talking sport and the man I do more than the score with is a walking encyclopedia of sporting knowledge. You've heard him on the radio. You've been impressed by his knowledge. He is Troy Zantuck. G'day, Troy. Great to be back, Tony. And uh, looking forward especially to today's topic. I reckon it should be an absolute uh, barn burner. Well, I reckon it's a combination of two things that uh, you and I have had a lifelong interest in, that being, well, sport, but in particular, AFL, VFL, and military history. And the reason those two come together is because of, well, uh, I think uh, one of the most solemn, um, one of the greatest days in the Australian national calendar, that, of course, being Anzac Day, Troy. Absolutely, Tony. And I, I know it's a a very special uh, subject to the hearts of a lot of Australians and New Zealanders who went to war in both the World, World War I and World War II, uh, the Anzacs, that great fighting spirit. And we've got a lot to be thankful for on, on this very, it's, it's an emotional day. The best way to describe it, a roller coaster of emotions, Tone. True. Uh, well, you look at how small Australia was as a country and uh, to have lost so many in the flower of its youth, so many young men who uh, were also sportsmen. That goes for World War One, World War Two, the Bull War. Um, looking at the the casualties, Troy, it was quite interesting. Haven't lost a footballer after 1945, so there were none in Vietnam or the Gulf Wars. Um, I thought there might have been at least an umpire involved in a peacekeeping operation somewhere yes. in Somalia. You know the way that. An umpire will always rush to a melee and you can always hear them go, all right, all right, break it up, break it up. I, th I thought I'll, that might have come in handy there, but no. I'll uh, raise a Ray Chamberlain, uh, a tremendous exponent of uh, breaking up the fracker. <laughs> That's right. Where's the Nobel Peace Prize for Razor, I ask. <laughs> but what we're going to do uh, today is just look at a bit of the history of the Anzac Day round, as far as the AFL and VFL goes, and look at the intertwined histories of the uh, Australian Defence Force, because uh, footballers have served in and died in all three branches of the Australian military. And so we're just going to examine the connection between the two and how, uh, how they're intertwined. And I know, Troy, you have been hitting the history books. I have been hitting the history books, Tone, and as far as uh, our great game of AFL football, VFL football back in the day, well, it's, it really kicked off in unusual circumstances in 1961 when the VFA, the VFA, the Victorian Football Association, got together with the support of the RSL and they moved the game between rivals Sandringham and Moorabbin to, of all places, the MCG. Wow. So they were, they were the pioneers, in a sense, of where we are today. Uh, yeah, the game was played in 1961. The only thing is it only attracted a crowd of 15,000, which was a good crowd for a VFA game. Yeah. But in the, in the cavernous surroundings of the MCG, it needs to be filled to get that, you know, that pumping emotion. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, incredibly, uh, two VFA teams kicked off what the tradition that we have today. That's remarkable. I and mean, the venue is auspicious as well, I guess, as you say, Troy, because uh, it was used in World War II to house troops. I, mean, I know American troops were there and you would know that the yes. 1945 grand final couldn't be played there. It had to be played at Prince's Park. But, yes, and of um, course, that, that was the bloodbath time. Oh, and uh, what a grand final that was. I think we only lost the last surviving player of that game in the last couple of years, and he couldn't remember the game because he was clocked. He was a carbon player who'd been knocked out in the first couple of minutes. Um, absolutely remarkable. There ought to be a movie about that, but I digress. But the interesting thing, Troy, if you, if you look at the history of Anzac Day in Australian history... It went through, and I think it might have been the 60s, it went through a period there where the public had largely lost interest in it. It didn't really mean what it means today. And I think it may have been reinvigorated, sadly, by the passing of a lot of the men and women who'd served in uh, World War II. Um, and, of course, now it's grown to, as I said, just uh, it's an incredibly important day 
on the national calendar. So this, with 15,000 people, and you're right, inauspicious, they, it, it, look, uh, they're almost outnumbered by Sheffield Chill spectators, you'd have to say. Where, uh, well, hang on a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of creative license there, Tone. I just want you to temper, temper that statement right down, okay? Because it's funny okay. that you bring up the 60s and 70s, uh, obviously the 60s, because in 1962 and 67, the Victorian team of the previous year played a game against the rest of the league uh, yep. in the in 62 and 67, which was interesting in itself. But again, only attracted a crowd of 20,000, under 20,000, which for such talent on display yeah. at the MCG, I find those figures incredible. You would have thought 50,000 upwards. But as you said, the interest level wasn't there on Anzac Day to attend football games. But fast forwarding to the mid 70s, that's when things picked up. And you'll be very happy to hear this. 1975, Carlton versus Essendon. An amazing game. Huge draw cards, both teams, attracting a crowd of just under 78,000 people wow. at VFL Park. Okay, so that... interest, interest was spiked, Tone. Well, um, it, it, isn't it remarkable that they honoured the sacrifice of Australian soldiers by making the sacrifice themselves of going to that awful ground in the middle of nowhere? Yes, and as we know, Arctic Park, but uh, yep. 1975. And Des Tudnam, uh, one of Collingwood's oh, greats, was, he was captain, captain coach of the Bombers that day. And the Bombers prevailed by 17 points, you'll be happy to know, with a young Simon Madden. Simon ah. Madden putting six goals through the big sticks. Uh, look, tremendous player. His brother was pretty handy too and ended up being a, uh, a Carlton Premiership player, as we know. And, then, and a parliamentarian. Well, that's you right. Like. Minister, yeah. Uh, so if, you, um, if uh, you're watching this in the shadow of a large apartment building in the CBD, <laughs> you can thank <laughs> Harry for that. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, no, so, absolutely. So um, can you tell us then, Troy, because you're the man to know, um, it's now enshrined, and no pun intended, but it's now enshrined as a game between Collingwood and Essendon. It is easily one of the biggest games of the year outside the grand final, of course. Um, how did it end up being those two clubs that, that had a lock on the Anzac Day game? Well, it's a great story, Tone, but I'll just mention probably the catalyst for where we are today as far as crowds go. Okay. 1977, I'll take you back there, a very famous year, known for the first drawn grand final against Collingwood and North Melbourne. But another yeah. tremendous game was played that year on Anzac Day between the Tigers and the Magpies. And there was a crowd of just under 93. 93,000 people wow. at the MCG. So I reckon that's where the catalyst was. And a guy who was playing in a back pocket that day for the Tigers may have been one K. Sheedy. Ooh. Uh, it was remembered that day, a very famous day, uh, a young David Miller from Ormond Amateurs, on debut, if you don't mind, kicked yep. five goals for the Tigers. KB was running rampant with more possessions than a haunted house, 25. Yep. And a young man called Shane Bond, who uh, was a, a rover, a Will of the Wisp goal sneak. He kicked four goals for the Magpies. And fabulous Phil Carmen slotted through three. But uh, the scores were the Pies 17 24, 126. So the Tigers 14 16, 100. So to get a crowd of that magnitude, on that day, I think was a four a forerunner for where we are today. Well, that crowd were uh, that would have been thrilled with a game that was that high scoring. You'd have whiplash at that rate. Yeah. Troy. <laughs> Absolutely, Dan. But uh, you mentioned obviously where we are today, and that Collingwood Essendon rivalry. It, apart from the grand final, as you said uh, in the introduction, the hottest ticket on the uh, yep. AFL calendar as far as a game goes. The first game took place in 1995. And Kevin Sheedy got together with then 
RSL president and absolute magpie fanatic, the great man, Brucey e. Ruxton. Yeah. Yep. And I think the genesis of the plans for this game were hatched. And I think that's where the beginning was. And boy, oh boy, what a first game it was, Tone. 94,825 fans attended. And it was an incredible game because it ended up in a draw. Ah. Uh, the, the Bombers 16 15 111. The Magpies 17 9 111. Okay, well, you say it was a draw, or was it a bit like uh, World War I? They had to negotiate an end to the game, but <laughs> then dragged on and on with one of the parties being very, very unhappy about it all. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a bad analogy. Uh, some, some careers were launched that day. and Oh, uh, yes, let's hear them, please. Some careers were made. Nine goals from the big man, the Savaloy Rocker oh. by Baby Severio Rocker with nine goals. Yep. And the three Brownlow votes, you would think if you've slotted through nine, that yeah. you're a fair chance to get the three. Uh, Collingwood's present day coach, Nathan Buckley, received the three Brownlow votes on that day. Well, somehow that just doesn't surprise because he was... Uh, just seriously, one of the greatest players I've seen in my time watching the game. I loved watching Buckley play, I've got to say. And uh, it was always a hot tip for a blinder against Carlton. But, geez, he was sublime. Um, <laughs> well, everyone was, yeah, but, really, Tony, weren't they? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so well, not in 95, can I just point oh, out? So I think that nearly slipped past you, then. Oh, gee. You think I was going to let that go? Oh, thank you. Absolutely mad. Caught. Um, I knew that would happen. His left mid. Um, now, so it would have averaged about that then for, uh, I, I would imagine, for the last 25 years then. The, the attendances have, they have been absolutely incredible. Uh, the head-to-head, -head, Collingwood with 15 wins, the Bombers with nine, and obviously that draw. Uh, yep. Some of the stats for the most games played you're uh, a great student of the game. Now, on probability, who would have represented either the Bombers or the Magpies in the most Anzac Day games, considering how many games they played in total? Oh, that would be uh, a gangly backman for the Essendon Football Club. I tell you what, you were very, very close. You know how close you were? You were absolutely spot on. Thank you. Dustin Fletcher. Fantastic. Yep. And the big he, well, he would have been... It was 95 his debut year because he was about 16 or 17 then, wasn't he? Yeah, 93. Uh, 93, he was a baby bomber. Played on Sticks Kernahan <laughs> in that grand final. If you can remember. I I uh, know. Sorry, I, it just I mean, it, it broke up there. You'll have to ask another question. Why don't we talk about something else? I'm like the director of the World Health Organization here. Did oh, somebody yes. mention Taiwan? What? Ted no, Ross. I can't hear Ted you. Ross. <laughs> Good on you, Ted Ross. Uh, just, just, just as far as he played, uh, Dustin played 18 of Anzac Day games out of a possible 21. An incredible performance. My God. And, and Matthew Lloyd, 3AW zone, Matthew Lloyd, played yep. 13 games for 36 goals. So he nearly averaged three goals a game, which is an incredible performance. His old man played for Carlton. And, uh, yes, yes. And his son didn't. That's all I'm saying. And his son didn't. He would have been handy in the, uh, the old dark navy blue jumper. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I... yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Why don't you keep stabbing me in the heart here, Troy? I'm enjoying this. Oh, I'll tell you what, mate. I, <laughs> some of mine just quietly. <laughs> yeah. I've got a few, uh, just a few more quick stats for you, Tony. Oh, please, to go all, for it. All the viewers and listeners. So most goals in a game, Severio Rocker, obviously nine in yep. 95. Uh, and he also kicked seven in 1998. So the big games, Sav was uh, on song, make no mistake about it. Anzac Day who, medals. Who, sorry, Troy, but who was on him in both of those games? Who let him kick nine? Well, they they remain unknown. <laughs> They've changed their name <laughs> by deed, Paul. <laughs> what, what, is there a tomb of the unknown backman? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And every time those games are played, the yeah. fullback is pixelated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're onto something, the unknown yeah. backman. I love it. Yeah. Uh, the Anzac medalists. Now, obviously, for the best on the ground in, um, in, a, in a Collingwood Essendon game on Anzac Day, no surprises here. James Hurd with three in 2000, 2003, 2004. And the Matrix-like Scott Pendlebury with three oh, in yeah. 2010, 11 and 19. That so, is, well, you know, no, no surprises there at all. Um, I want to, I mean, this is a, a, I guess, a kind of serious note. And it's been well, look, it's been well thrashed out, but... There's something I always find a bit discomforting about the the comparison of uh, you know when the teams line up and there's there's this kind of I, I would argue overplayed solemnity, solemnity to the whole thing and and this kind of comparison of footballers as soldiers. Um, I'm not doubting uh, the soldiers' phys- sorry the players' physical bravery. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, there's not quite the same jeopardy, uh, you know, as you're, as you're running for a ball. As, as it's not quite uh, flying a Lancaster over Bremen or uh, uh, Nuremberg with uh, the world's most lethal integrated air defence system underneath you and trying very hard to kill you, for example. Um, I, I wonder how that sits with you, Troy. Yeah, look, those comparisons to me are absolutely ludicrous. It, it, the guys that went to war, they're the true heroes. Make no mistake about it. The yeah, AFL, VFL football, it's only a game, but it is a game that brings so many people together. And yeah. I think that to commemorate the memories of the soldiers who gave their life and who fought for us, I, I think that that's massive. And I think it brings together the community on Anzac Day. And it's amazing yeah. what sport can do, but to make comparisons between those who gave their life and a guy running, uh, running back into a pack, yeah, they they're just absurd to be honest, huh? Yeah, no, no, fair enough. Because I guess if if you do extend that uh, an analogy, uh, looking back, I don't know I'm fixating on World War Two here, but I'd almost like to have seen. General Rommel give a press conference after his loss at El Alamein. Yes, um, Irwin. Yeah, Irwin. Just going. Oh, look. You know, look. Full credit to the Eighth Army of Montgomery. They were they were just on song today, and look, they they had all the answers, logistics. They had us covered there, and uh, look, you know, we tried countering with the deadly eighty eight uh, anti aircraft gun, the lethal anti tank weapon. There's no doubt about that. But uh, everything way we, we had. We a lot of good boys who were really united under the leadership group of Adolf Hitler and uh, and Goering. There's no doubt about that. There's no disharmony where we are. But look, I uh, know like well played to the, well played to General Montgomery. Yeah, so, it would have been a fascinating press conference with. Uh, yes. I, don't, I don't think there would have been so many Gatorade bottles at the front of that or at the back of that. No. Uh, Irwin Rommel. Was, no, no was he the exactly. desert? Was he the Desert Fox? Was that his he moniker? Was, he was the Desert Fox. Yeah. Yes. And he had an interesting relationship with Montgomery, didn't he? Well, he did. They, um, a respect, a healthy respect. Yes, yes. Because it was that, believe it or not, it was that kind of war. It was the, the veterans of it uh, were almost misty-eyed when they talked about their opponents. It was, it was more gentlemanly because everybody was under these incredibly harsh conditions. Um, and, and there was something... Uh, there was an absence of, I think, malice or, or atrocities. Uh, let me just say that that were found in other theatres of World War Two, but they didn't they didn't quite sort of apply there because, um, yeah, there everyone was equal before those absolutely brutal conditions. I think you might argue. And and obviously, you being a an aviation aficionado and a military historian, what were some of the planes that took uh, took part in World War One and World War Two. Well, I can tie it back to our theme, Troy, and tell you about uh, Bluey Truscott, who flew Spitfires yes. in, uh, in Europe after the Battle of Britain. He wasn't involved in the Battle of Britain. He, of course, was a captain of Melbourne. A lot of people would know that. Melbourne have named yeah. their BNF trophy after him, which I think is a great touch. 
Um, he came back after Japan entered the war and he was flying, uh, he was flying in the north and I'm trying to remember what squadron, but he would have been flying Kitty Hawks and it was in that aircraft that he lost his life. He was practicing um, an air combat manoeuvre, which is what they used to do with, a, with an yeah. Australian plane called a Catalina and he went in behind it and I think what may have happened, it's easy to lose situational awareness depending on the time of day when you're over water and um, he maybe wasn't looking at his instruments and didn't realise that the water was closer than it was. Um, and he unfortunately went in. So he didn't die in combat. But uh, um, so that's... Uh, and, and reading the list on Wikipedia of, of AFL, well, VFL footballers who died, there are a lot in the Air Force, obviously, a lot uh, in the Pacific region. And there was a lot who uh, served in the RAF, as many air crew did. They trained here or they trained in Canada or Africa. Then they went over to the RAF and then they were just scattered to all different uh, squadrons as needed. And there are quite a few fighter pilots in there too. And uh, you had to be good to be a fighter pilot. So it's no, no uh, surprise at all that Bluey Truscott ended up in, in flying the sort of aircraft that he did. And a tremendous honour also, Tone, that... Melbourne have named their best and fairest after Bluey Truscott. Yes, well, it's, uh, I think it's wonderful that they continue to honour his memory and his legacy because as far as I know, and you'll be able to confirm this, Troy, he was a grand finalist, wasn't he? He was a, he was a premiership player? Absolutely, absolutely. And you also bring up another a great name in VFL, AFL history, uh, yeah. Ron Barassi's father, Ron Barassi Sr., yeah. Uh, he, he died at Tobruk in, in 1941. Um, and they had, Ron Barassi actually had the honour of lighting the cauldron at the first Melbourne Richmond Anzac Eve game. And wow. I was lucky enough, I was lucky enough to attend last year's game. Yep. And it was absolutely, it was amazing. The, the emotion and when they played the last post. Um, yeah. And, and they blackened all the ground out and people uh, yeah. had their iPhones and obviously with, with, the, uh, with the lights and that minute silence, it's absolutely awe-inspiring. It's incredible. So, yeah, Barras lit the cauldron in 2015 and that's another Anzac Day tradition which is gaining a lot of momentum. The Anzac Eve game, uh, Melbourne versus Richmond. Uh, the Tigers have won three out of those five clashes. Uh, and as I said, that was my first time that I'd been to an Anzac Eve game. I've been to mm. many Anzac Day Collingwood Essendon games and, and loved them. Uh, was lucky enough to attend the 2005 game, which uh, my nephew Ty, Ty Zantuck, played ah. for Essendon. Yeah. And he said that was the highlight of his career. So uh, to be part of it would be an amazing, an amazing thing for a player. But to be there uh, in the crowd is just, uh, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, Tone. Yeah, look, uh, it, I, I guess I like it as a spectacle. I know we talked earlier about, I guess, how heavy the symbolism is, but um, uh, I think it's a very worthy thing for the, for the AFL to acknowledge. And there's no, there's no quibble from, from this side of uh, our conversation, Troy, that the AFL commemorates that. Some of the other um, commemoration rounds it does, I would argue with or, or not be as, I don't know, uh, agreeable to, but this is not the time nor the place to thrush it out now. But yeah, when I see, um, when I see the serving men and women of the Australian Defence Force, current and past being honoured, uh, that, is, that is definitely a good thing because just to backtrack to that Wikipedia page, the World War One and World War Two sites, um, the list is seemingly endless, and then you realise these aren't VFL players who have served; these are VFL players who have died, and it's got where they died, and and maybe a rough thumbnail as to how they died, or you can deduce it. You know, if if they're in the RAF and they've died over a German city, then you can work that out. There's, uh, or their ship has, has been torpedoed or whatever. So these guys died in the, in the service of their country. And I was really taken with, uh, well, if you, you know, uh, um, 
go through a time machine. Well, if you, if you look at it today, can you imagine your favourite players, let's say, risking life and limb on a daily basis, go being plucked from, you know, the, the, the fame and the fortune they have now, and then uh, being in the Arctic Circle in a ship during convoy duties, or being in a trench in Gallipoli eating yeah. uh, maggot-infested corned beef. It's just unthinkable to get your head around that. Well, it is unthinkable, uh, as you said. And a lot of those guys that gave their life, lives in the war would have been heroes back home yeah. in, in their fields of sport. Yep. So for the people back home to hear that their heroes, their sporting heroes, had died in, in conflict, it would have been an amazing jolt. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, and totally true. So, yeah, look, I mentioned picking up the paper and, and finding out um, yeah, your favourite player is he's not ever going to play again because he's died in the service of his country. He he had a presumably had a choice. He 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 didn't try to use that fame and fortune to get a cushy job behind the lines. He no, he stepped up. He well and truly stepped up. I think that's why Tony. It's such an emotional day in the Australian mm. psyche, and and for Melburnians, obviously, we being Melburnians, for that pilgrimage to the shrine, yeah. the dawn service. And a lot of those people go along and attend the game at the MCG against the Bombers and the Pies. And it brings a lot of generations together. I think it's a great thing, a, a generational get together, mm. Anzac Day. And I think, as you said, from probably the 70s onwards, it slowly gained momentum. And it, as I said, in the 95, when 94,825 people attended, well, the momentum was a tidal wave. Yeah, and, you know, we were saying it is a, it's a marquee game for the AFL and it's a great pity that we won't see it this year. But I guess, look, uh, we understand the, the challenge we're all facing with uh, the Wuhan virus or coronavirus, but... It, it just means, and I'm sure you'd agree, Troy, that next year, provided we're given the all clear, and God willing, we will be, could you imagine the roar at next year's uh, Anzac Day game, the 2021 Anzac Day, and just the sense of occasion that will, uh, that will accompany that game? Well, well if, the MCG, game. if the MCG had a roof tone, I I'm, <laughs> dare say next year, it would have taken the roof off with that roar at the first bounce. But just with the roar, the silence to me, nearly 100,000 people for one minute coming together and not hearing a murmur in the crowd, that, that, that's one of the most amazing things to me, the games that I've attended. It's just, it's indescribable emotionally. Uh, well, not having ever been to one, Troy, I'm going to have to take your word for it, but there is something very impressive about the... I don't know, the collective will or the discipline or, or the, the reverence. I mean, that's, that is a mark of true that, respect for not one person who's uh, maybe loaded up before the game. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? One of their yeah, gunfire breakfast. But, but to, to be aware of that sense of occasion, I think, is great. And, and again, and another thing is it does build to that tension before the first bounce. And that's why it is such an amazing spectacle because there's, there's so much... I don't know, pomp and ceremony that goes with it. Um, so yeah. not being either a Carlton, uh, I mean, a Collingwood or Essendon fan, you can still get into that game. You absolutely, that's a great point, Tony. You can still get emotionally invested yeah. in that game. Uh, th there, were, there are other games around Australia that have been played on Anzac Day and Fremantle, they have the, uh, the Lynn Hall tribute game. Okay. Uh, and that, that's a tribute to our to the last Gallipoli uh, veteran, Len Hall. That was first held in 1996, where the Ds played Frio and the Ds got up by 37 points. Very important, that particular game, to the people of Western Australia with one of the great veterans, uh, Len Hall. And yep. they commemorate his service in that game. And one that may escape a few people, but not too many St Kilda supporters... They played three games in Wellington, New Zealand. Do you remember that experiment? The reason yeah. I remember it is because <laughs> it was such a dismal year for Carlton and take your pick, but it was one of Carlton's few wins 
in fact, I think Carlton had gone halfway through the year and had not won on mainland Australia. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a great memory, Tone. Carlton victories in the last decade have been few and far between, so they do tend to stick in the memory, Troy. Uh, undefeated in Wellington. Uh, also, <laughs> the Sydney, Sydney Swans in Brisbane and the Blue Baggers. Saints, zero and three. Uh, well, uh, well, what can you say? Um, what can, I've, got, I've just got nothing to, I've got nothing to uh, add to that, Troy. What, what, what can you do? But uh, I think we've, uh, we've, we've given uh, some, great, um, some great background to Anzac Day in a football sense today. And obviously your military history is uh, second to none, Tom. Uh, well, it uh, pales compared to your sporting knowledge, Troy, but that's, I like to think, one of the things that makes this vodcast, uh, more than the score, such a watchable feast of entertainment. So thank you for that, Troy. Troy Zantuck doing the great Thanks, job Tom. that he does every week here uh, on Isolation TV with more than the score. I've been Tony Moakley. Great to have your company and we we'll look forward to chatting to you again soon.